Thank you, Julie. You were a great student. <laughs> So many thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this fascinating event. And uh, in the Family Dog Project group, we've uh, conducted uh, hundreds of experiments. And most of our owners were asked to complete a questionnaire that included a question about how they would define their relationship with their dogs, or rather the status of uh, their dogs. And we have analyzed uh, thousands of responses by now. And most of the owners chose family member and child. So this can be, of course, partly due to our relatively biased sample, because we mainly use, uh, work with the pet dog owners. However, we may assume specific changes in dog keeping habits during the last few decades. Uh, in, in most parts of the world. Uh, this uh, shot was taken in Tokyo, Japan, a few years ago. Both owners are taking uh, photos of the little Shiba dressed in pink clothes. But the most interesting feature of the photo, for me at least, is the second dog in the baby carriage. So from that time, I began to watch baby carriages on the streets, and I could detect that in about two-thirds of the baby carriages, there was a dog and not a human infant. Okay, so based on many significant behavioral studies, it's been suggested that uh, the dog is a very special species in many respects. First, in contrast to wolves, dogs, our pet dogs, seem to show similar behavior responses to that of human infants in many test situations, investigating their social behavior, their uh, social cognitive abilities. Uh, let's just see two most important examples, attachment and attention. Attachment from an ethological approach is not just love or social attraction. Attachment is a behavior system, an asymmetrical social bond which presumes the dependency of the attached individual to the attachment figure. And the, this attachment figure, in our case the owner, serves as a secure base, as a safe haven for the attached individual, the dog. And many studies revealed significant similarities in the dog owner and human infant attachment behaviors. A comparative study found species-specific differences in wolves and dogs in this respect. In contrast to dog puppies, socialized and hand-reared wolves didn't show the specific patterns of attachment behavior. Again, the ability to develop new attachment relationships is usually associated with an early sensitive period in dogs. In contrast, we found that uh, shelter dogs, adult shelter dogs, were able to develop a new attachment bond after just uh, three short handling sessions with an unfamiliar experimenter. And now there is evidence that despite separation from the first attachment figure, the puppy walker guide dogs are able to establish a successful new attachment bond with their final blind owners. And about attention, dogs are sensitive to the attentional cues of humans. They can rely on the orientation of our head, they can rely on the visibility of our eyes. Even puppies tend to look at the owner in conflict situations and uh, look at the experimenter in task situations. Just watch this dog puppy. Uh, the experimenter tries to attract the attention Oh, it's a little bit slow, but I hope it's gonna be all right. Okay, in contrast, you can see a wolf puppy. Can we have some sound on the videos? Because it would be interesting with the wolf because the wolf is growling. 
Oh, yeah? Thank you. So the experimenter tries to attract the attention. He wants to go and make a decision on his own. He decided where to go, and that's it. OK, and again, the next trial. So if a wolf wants to go, then it wants to go. <laughs> OK, so our second point is that human social cues can affect dogs' cognitive performance. And in some situations, it's very interesting because uh, these human cues can lower their success rate. So let me show you some examples how human social signals can mess up the performance of dogs. That's a two-way choice test. First, the dogs could see the, hide, the experimenter hiding the bait, a piece of food, in one container. So it was full, in full view of the dog. Then this direct visual cue was contradicted by the experimenter's pointing gesture. After this deceptive pointing, in half of the trials, the dogs chose the indicated, that's the empty container. Another study investigated the influence of the owner on their dog's performance in a food choice task. Now the food was placed on two plates, visibly, for, uh, for the dog, and condition one was a basic quantity discrimination task uh, where the dogs could choose between a smaller and a larger quantity of food, and they were pretty successful in this. Uh, in uh, condition three, dogs could choose between two equally small quantities of food, uh, but in this case, uh, they could choose only after they could see their owner favoring one plate, and the owner's action had a strong effect on the dog's choice. Condition three was the most important and most interesting, uh, because here they again could choose between a small and a large quantity of food, but in this situation, uh, the owner expressed her preference towards the small quantity. And interestingly, in this situation, they chose the large quantity of food only in the 32% of the trials, which was significantly less than in condition one. So again, the owner had a great effect on the performance of the dog. Uh, again, there's a new study that's about the ability of inferential reasoning, that's making inferences by exclusion. Uh, again, there are two containers, they are turned upside down this uh, time, and the dog is pretrained that his favorite toy is hidden under one of them. Uh, so during the test, always the unbaited container was lifted. Uh, so the dog can, could see the empty container and infer that the toy should be under the other. So if it's not here, it must be there. That's the inference here. And um, it was interesting that when a human, an experimenter, manipulated, lifted the empty container, the dogs showed a preference towards uh, to this uh, manipulated, the empty container. But... When the container was lifted remotely uh, by a string, then dogs show that they are able to use inferential reasoning in this task. So let's see a final example how dogs can be misguided by human social communicative and referential cues. Because it seems that dogs are really successful when uh, in the task when the human given view is in line with the efficient solution of the situation, of the problem. But uh, otherwise, they fail. So this is a well-known experiment in developmental psychology. It's called the A not B task. Uh, there are two boxes. Uh, 
to hiding places, to hiding locations, A and B. And the experimenter hides the toy four times in A, in location A, visibly in full view uh, for the inf infant who can find the toy, look for the toy. And it's interesting that 10 months old, despite having seen the object hidden later in the next three trials, under location B, look for it uh, in box A. That's the A, not B error. And there have been a hot debate about what causes this typical error, the A, not B error. And uh, recently, Hungarian researchers revealed that one feature, one important feature of uh, this experimental procedure was that the hiding was done in a social communicative context, uh, making eye contact with the baby, using baby talk. And they suggested that these human-given views could contribute to the commitment of the error. Uh, they could prepare the infant to go into a learning mode, to uh, learn something more general rule about the situation. That is, okay, this toy belongs to hiding place A. There is a connection between them. There is a rule about this. What they did is that they tried to test their hypothesis using two different kind of groups. In one group, the hiding was done uh, in the usual communicative social context, and in the other case, uh, that was a non-social, non-communicative context. And indeed, they could reveal that these 10-month-old babies committed much more error in the communicative social situation. Okay, why is it important for us? It's because the test was then performed with pet dogs and socialized wolves to compare the influence of the experimenter, the human, on their performance. And the same two types of uh, hiding procedures were used for them, for the eight trials. And uh, again, we are interested in their performance in the B trials because that's where they can commit the A not B error. So on the figure, you can see uh, their results in the B trials, now in the non-social situation. So you can see that both dogs and wolves could solve the problem in the non-social situation. They didn't commit the A not B error. And wolves were equally successful in the social communicative context. So they were smart, they were great. Okay, what about dogs? They were not. So I think the, the beautiful thing here is that uh, it's not that dogs, we can prove that, okay, dogs are very smart and they, they are cognitively very well developed, but here they, their performance, their error resembled to that of human infants, and that's what is most important here. Okay, so the last and major point from my original list, that dogs can learn very efficiently through observation from humans, from us. Uh, our dogs mostly learn in a social context, even if it's individual learning, try and error learning, shaping. Social learning, learning through observation from a group member, uh, a dog or a human, may happen in many situations, spontaneously without our intention to train the dog, without any direct reward. So for example, our dogs can learn to manipulate objects. Uh, they can learn to panic in thunderstorms. They can learn to do gardening job. They can learn how to escape from cages, from canals. Uh, social learning is a very efficient way to solve problems. The detour, so-called detour test, is a typical procedure to study dogs' ability for social learning. Uh, now, the, the toy is placed here by the experimenter. Uh, the dog cannot see the hiding. And then the task for the dog is to get the toy by detouring along the fence. That's a V-shaped, three-meter-long fence. 
and uh, the subject couldn't see the placement but was led to the toy and then back to the starting point. So they knew that the toy is there. And dogs in the control group had to solve the problem on their own in several trials. But you can see that uh, their performance didn't improve during the trials. And in the first trial, uh, all group, in, uh, dogs in all group uh, had to try to get the toy on their own. But if, uh, in the demonstration groups uh, from the second trial, the uh, dogs first could see some kind of demonstration before uh, having the possibility to, to try uh, to solve the problem. And there are different kinds of demonstrations, owner or an unfamiliar person, uh, or an unfamiliar dog could demonstrate the detour along the fence. Uh, here you can see the results of the control uh, dogs. The light green column shows the latency uh, of the successful detour in the first trial, and the dark green shows the latency in the second trial. So that you can see that there is no improvement. And uh, I show you one example that could be either a control dog or any dog in the first trial. So that was the typical reaction. They tried to get the toy where they could see it. So they didn't try to go along, to walk along the fence on their own. Uh, however, after a demonstration from the owner and an unfamiliar experimenter, their performance improved. So both the owner and an unfamiliar experimenter proved to be efficient demonstrators uh, because you can see that the dogs could get their toys faster up, after observing them uh, walking around the fence. So uh, another aspect of this study that also dogs from multi-dog households were tested, and they were sorted, they were grouped uh, as dominant and subordinate individuals based on the questionnaire that was completed by the owner. And uh, in this case, they could uh, see either a human or a dog demonstrator. And when an unfamiliar dog was uh, used as a demonstrator, subordinate dogs were significantly better than the dominant ones. But there was no difference between them a, when a human demonstrator uh, walked along the fence. Oh. Now I'd like to present a study where the aim was to investigate if dogs are able to learn the basics of imitation. This method named the the do as I do relies on social learning. Uh, but dogs first have to learn to match their behavior to some actions displayed by a human experimenter, a human partner, a demonstrator, on command, do it. That uh, the, dog had, the dogs had to learn to perform the same action that corresponds to the human's demonstration. That is, you can teach your dog however you want to turn around, for example. And then the owner turns around and say, do it. And then the dog is supposed to turn around. So I jump and I say, do it. And the dog is supposed to jump. Uh, so when it's ready, when it's OK, then the big question was, if dogs are able to generalize this rule to novel action. And uh, this was a report with Adam Mekloshi on the Do As I Do project. And the reporter asked us to show some really new action, the first time in front of the cameras. And I, I found out that, OK, I will go to the door, and I, I, I would pretend that I lock the door, and I say, do it to the dog. And you can see the dog, you can see how it's processing. Nothing else, just the do it command. And that's what happened. That was the very first time this dog was never 
told to open doors or anything. So Claudia Fugaza uh, carried out an improved version of this uh, experiment with a group of dogs and th their owners. And they study the efficiency of the do-as-I-do method and clicker training shaping uh, was compared with uh, uh, in, uh, using three different kinds of novel object-related actions. There could be simple actions, just like touching something with a nose or a paw, or complex actions, just like opening a drawer, or action sequences like uh, jumping on a chair and touching something with the nose. And uh, in both groups, the dogs and their owners were experienced in the method they used. The test was run only on novel actions. I show you an example that's a complex action. Oh, yeah. So the owner demonstrates the action and say, do it in Italian. Brava. And that's it. So that's not an assistant dog. Ancora una volta così? Yeah, that's Claudia. <laughs> okay, and you can see the results here, one, uh, one uh, part of the results. Uh, the mean latencies of the first occurrence of the action. And you can see that, especially in the case of the complex actions and action sequences, the do-as-I-do method uh, was uh, more efficient than clicker training because dogs learned faster uh, the action that was taught, that was demonstrated in, in this case. Okay, so what about spontaneous imitation? A few years ago, uh, young assistant dogs uh, were trained to switch the light on and off, and I took some photos. Uh, there were owners and trainers and puppy walkers and children around us, and we encouraged the dogs and praised the dogs if, if for their success, and that's what happened. Okay, so let's go back to science. <laughs> this is my final example of social learning. Uh, in this case, not on dogs, but on parrots. But I believe that the motor rival training uh, uh, has a very great potential for uh, dog trainers as well. This method was applied by Irene Pepperberg to teach Alex, the gray parrot, uh, to speak. Uh, especially to name objects, and the trainer, instead of uh, interacting with the parrot, in this case, interacts with an assistant, a model, and this model demonstrates what the parrot is supposed to do. That's name the object, speak out loudly the word, uh, what's requested. And, uh, for example, it's about the spoon, that, okay, that spoon, and the reward is very interesting in this situation because uh, the model is over, uh, also a rival of Alex, so serves as a rival because uh, when successful, he can play with the object, with the spoon, and Alex can only watch. Uh, the same procedure can be done with two parrots using one, an experienced one, as a model and rival. And the, the uh, procedure works this way as well. Okay, there's another aspect of the story. Now, just a few words about rewards. Uh, yes, we know, we all know food reward works in most cases. But is food really the only and ultimate way to reward our dogs. What about social reward? Uh, we don't have much data on the potentials of uh, different types of reward. Uh, however, in a recent study, the efficiency of uh, social interaction and food used as a reward uh, was compared and uh, they found that social reward was inefficient. However, uh, considering some issues in the experimental procedure, I would be very careful to generalize these results uh, for um, different tasks and, and to our pet dogs. Uh, 
especially because we have different types of evidences on, on this respect, in this respect. For example, we can observe social learning without, uh, happening without any direct reward. Uh, in another study, we, we asked owners to modify their usual way how they approach their uh, home after a daily walk. And uh, we asked them to make a short detour in front of the entrance. And during this detour, uh, first the dogs only followed the owners, but later on they went ahead and uh, began to lead the owners on this detour, which didn't make sense for them. And the authors described the phenomenon as social anticipation. That is, the le dog learned uh, the sequence of actions uh, performed by a group mate, the owner, and could adjust its behavior to it. Uh, and this ability, I think, can contribute to cooperative processes between dog and owner and could help uh, in the synchronization of our behaviors. So there are different views. And uh, now I would like to present two recent studies where different forms of learning and uh, different forms of reward played an, impro played an important role. Uh, this study, the first one, was based on practical training methods uh, used by a charity we've been uh, cooperating with. They train assistant dogs for the disabled, and uh, they use social methods. For example, they train uh, the dogs carry the basket uh, using the modal arrival method and using only social reward. Uh, also based on the success of the do-as-I-do method, we assumed that puppies could efficiently learn socially in some object-related tasks, even without this massive prior conditioning stage. Maybe the default state in our puppies is social learning. So, what we did is uh, we compared the behavior of puppies in two groups, one was, again, an apparent conditioning, a clicker training group, and the other was a social context group. They were uh, trained by, through demonstration, and they were rewarded only socially. And we used four, uh, three four-month-old puppy pairs. They were mainly siblings for the uh, test. The tasks were first, on the first session, uh, to place one paw on a box and on the second that was carrying a big Kong. And there was a third session when we retested both tasks. And the efficiency of uh, the two groups uh, was compared uh, through the number of successful individuals and uh, comparing different uh, behavior variables. Just uh, i show you a few examples uh, of the procedure just to see it better. That's the first session. Oh, well, yeah. The box uh, and the clicker group. The experimenter used the clicker, it was better, and the owner gave the food. Of course, all puppies were first pre-trained by the owner for click and food association. And that's the same scenario in the social context. Uh, could we get some sound? Okay, so this demonstration. Okay, then the, the dog can go and do whatever he wants to. There are no known words or commands used. There's no shaping during the testing phases. Yeah, it's a bit too loud. Huh? And that's social reward. So it was 16 minutes. 
with some breaks if it was necessary, and there was only social reward. Uh, okay, that's the Kong task. That was the second session, and again, uh, here there was two part, two parts of the demonstration. One is demonstration of the fetching action, and now you can see the other part, the rival uh, training. That's just not pushing the dog to carry the Kong. That's just like in case of the parrots. We manipulate with the owner, the experimenter and the owner manipulates the Kong. And now the dog has a chance to manipulate the object which was featured by the humans. <laughs> and again, you can see only social reward at the end. And please note that the dog still holds the object. So it's in, in the mouth, it's not just there. Okay. That's the retest phase, the third session with the box situation, uh, the box, box task, the social situation. Again, a little demonstration that's just, you remember, was that, then the dog, the chance, and it's there. And uh, that's a retest with a Kong, and that's a clicker situation. That was a food providing part. And now it's very interesting because now the dog approaches the Kong. He's supposed to grab it because that's the face. Now you could hear the click, but that's what's happening. So maybe because of the lack of social reference in the situation, dogs were confused. They look, look at the owner at the end. Okay, what's this? May I, may I grab it? Is it safe? So just preliminary results, because we only have 16 dog pairs puppy pairs. More puppies performed the task in the social group. Absolutely significant difference. And puppies in the social group approached and manipulated the object sooner than the clicker-trained groups. However, it seems that the clicker dogs uh, were better, at least in the box, box task, during the retest session, so they improved. Finally, I'd like to present a study where social and operant learning and social and food reward go hand in hand. And I think that's the best uh, situation. It's already 10 years ago that our group began to investigate the possibilities to conduct fMRI, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, measurements on awake and unrestrained dogs in order to find a non-invasive methodology to compare human and dog brain functions. And uh, we were successful. And in a recent study, we asked two major questions, whether there is a specific brain region in dogs for recognizing conspecific vocalization, and if there is a specific brain region for detecting the emotional content of human and dog vocalizations. Uh, what's mo most important is that the same set of stimuli was used in case of dog and human subjects. Uh, there were 11 pet dogs and 22 university students, human uh, subjects, tested with the same procedure. And we used vocal <laughs> stimuli that <laughs> ranged from emotionally highly positive, that's the human, uh, and that's the dog. <laughs> So the, 
it's not easy to find a positive sound, a vocalization in, in case of uh, dogs. Uh, so, ranged from emotionally highly positive to highly negative, that was the human, uh, sounds, and that's the dog. The sounds were rated by human listeners in a separate study. Uh, first, I tell you very briefly about the results, and then I would like to speak a little bit more about the training of the dogs for this study. This was the first comparative neuroimaging, neuroimaging study of a non-primate species and humans. And uh, it's important that we found functional analogies between dog and human non-primary auditory cortex. Uh, namely, we demonstrated that voice areas do exist in the dog brain, not just in primates, and um, that uh, the sensitivity to vocal emotional content, emotional balance, engages similarly located brain regions in the dog and the human brain. So, how could we get them to go into the scanner. They had to spend eight minutes without any reward, I mean, during these eight minutes, uh, and absolutely motionless in the scanner. And uh, I'm telling you, it's not fun. So I, I was there. Uh, of course, I, first I, I, I tried uh, it on myself, so it, it's not really good, because uh, that's a strange and noisy environment, uh, that's why we think that the dogs really need to uh, be able to use the owner as a safe haven in this situation. That's about attachment. And, okay, what about? Okay. So, it's not fun, but we think that they must feel it great, otherwise we wouldn't do this test anymore. So we communicate that he is great, and they believe it. So you can see the dog's reaction. That's the first training case. So they are really comfortable on the scanner bed. And that's social reward. And everybody has to show that we are proud of him. Oh, I'm sorry, this proud wasn't a, a scientific word. <laughs> so, uh, lying in this position, absolutely motionless, is not easy. So they cannot even lick their mouth. They cannot move any body parts. They cannot swallow. Uh, so that's really an ultimate self-control on the part of the dog how motionless they must be. So I've tried to illustrate the relative displacement of our dogs compared to that of dogs in another study by Barnes and colleagues. And that's the movement of the brain. Uh, and please note the scales. So here, uh, that's our study, one of our dogs. The scale is from zero to three millimeters. And on the burn study, it's from zero to 30 millimeters. So that's, that's a difference, I think. Okay, what about the training? So the training is a step-by-step -step, uh, training. It's not uh, uh, really a big fuss at the beginning. Uh, lying on the floor with the head placed between the poles, that's a uh, required position of the dog, and the same on the table, and so on. And then there's a training at the scanner uh, when we need to habituate them to the noise, uh, and uh, of course they wear an earphone in, in these cases, and uh, lying in a moving and vibrating scanner. But the major point of the training is communicating that being on the scanner bed is fun. So how do we do this? That's how motor driver training comes into the picture. <clears throat> yeah. So there's always one dog, 
that is being trained and rewarded by everybody. So that's the owner of this dog, but even the owner praises the other dog. So every, our attention is on him. We encourage him, we praise him, and she's just hanging around. She's watching, and we want her. So she seems to want to be part of the event, to participate in the party, which is on the scanner bed. Okay, next video. <sighs> yeah. We never push them. We don't give commands. So what else could they do? There's only one task, lying in position. So we can offer the food and wait. Okay, do you want to participate? Do you want to cooperate this time? It's great. Then, do you want to go into the scanner? Are you ready for this? So that's communication. We need voluntary subjects. It's not about you, that's a must. We give them as much time as they need. And it can depend on the occasion. So maybe today they are a little bit different. So that is food reward. So, this tail wagging was because of the two food reward, and now that social reward, again. They need both, so that's not an easy task. We don't let them jump up off the... So they are a little bit confused because they don't know if they were good or not, because they just lay there. They didn't do anything, so it, it's very difficult, especially for a working dog. Okay, some dogs work really for just praise. It depends on their relationship with the owner. So that's not food, now that's just praise on the other end of the tube. We cannot go with the camera to there. And uh, the last video, I think the most interesting, that was an accident, actually. Uh, the little dog here was not part of the study. He was just there because uh, the owner is a puppy walker and uh, he's going to be a hearing dog. He was just with us. Again, it's important that this dog doesn't work for food. <laughs> This dog works for a bowl which is not in the room at the moment. So there's no food, absolutely no food involved in the situation. And we ignore the other dog. We just work with the dog on the scanner bed. That's the rule. So he just wants to know what's going on. That could be fun, because we Oh, right there. So you can see these are spontaneous responses, not trained, not shaped. And it was about the older dog. Mm. Now I, I say it wasn't nice that the owner <laughs> let the dog jump. So it was a surprise for us as well. The dog didn't even know how to lie in position. But now, he, you can see, he's very happy. Finally, he could get there. And okay, I thought, okay, let's just to try to lift, it, lift him up. What could happen? That stage, <laughs> step-by-step -step procedure of the training. Okay, let's jump. Okay, a little, con and now, again, he's happy. He doesn't know why, but he's happy. So, finally, 
uh, just a few words, conclusions, implications for practitioners, maybe. That's my favorite saying, because it mirrors the ethological point of view. In nature, there are neither rewards nor punishments. There are consequences. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, recent dog training theories about learning mostly come from experiments on laboratory rats. And these models are, these models present a very plausible uh, way of thinking. And, but these are only models. They are the simplified versions of real life. They are not the whole story. So our dogs live in a very rich, interspecific social environment with us. And they have memories about previous events, previous interactions, not just training sessions, not just test situations. So I think we should keep in mind that social learning may occur even if we, don't know, we do not know about it spontaneously, without wanting it to happen. So I'd like to argue for the usefulness of training methods based on social learning. And uh, finally, positive reinforcement techniques are really great. And food reward is really necessary and efficient. I agree. But I think positive reinforcement can be anything that is motivating for the talk. For example, social interaction with us, with the owner. Uh, so uh, many thanks to the Family Dog Project group, because we are a, a group. We work together. And to my colleagues, Jozef Topal, uh, Claudia Fugazza, Bernadette Miklosi, Barbara Cibra, uh, Attila Andic, and of course, Adam Miklosi. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>